Hey Anya, it's Thursday and it's Poetry Project. Number 14. I can't believe we only have a couple of a couple of these left. It makes me so sad. Hmm. But I also feel like we'll probably find a way to fill fill the hole in our lives that Poetry Project is going to leave. And anyway, we still have uh, three of these things left, including today, so it's not qu not time for this kind of talk just yet, but but anyway, yeah, I can't believe we made it to 14. That's awesome, good for us. So today you asked me to read you some poetry by Algernon Charles Swinburne, um, a gentleman that I had the pleasure of meeting during my GRE studying. And I have to say, I'm glad you picked him because I think he has the best name ever. <laughs> Algernon Charles Swinburne. Like, that is just amazing. Um, he was a Victorian poet and it is a very Victorian name, so it makes me pretty happy for that reason. But uh, yes, he was a British gentleman and a Victorian poet. Um, he actually went to Oxford, but he didn't graduate. <laughs> and uh, see, mom, you can be successful and uh, not have a degree from Oxford. <laughs> um, yeah, but while he was at Oxford, he hung out with a bunch of pre-Raphaelites, including Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who also has the most Victorian name ever. Um, yeah, and he seemed like a pretty cool, pretty cool guy. Algernon, that is. Um, his poetry was a little scandalous at the time because he talked about sex. I know, scandal. Um, so yeah, he was a bit of a, a bit of a disturber in that, in that sense. But, uh, when I was studying for the GREs, I came across a really cool poem that I, that I loved. I'm like crazy about the rhyme scheme of this poem. It's called The, Gar the Garden of Proserpine. P-R-O- S E R P I N E, the goddess of the of the underworld, the one who like gets tricked with the um, the pomegranate and has to spend half the year in Hades. Yeah, I always thought it was pronounced Proserpine, <laughs> but um, at one point during the poem, he rhymes he rhymes it with a vine. So I was like, okay, well this guy seems to know what's up with rhymes, so it must be Proserpine. So Proserpine it is. Um, but I'm not going to read you the whole poem because it's quite long. So I'll read the first couple stanzas and then I'll skip down to the last few stanzas. Uh, yeah, a really cool poem. And when I was studying for the GREs, I bookmarked it to come back to later because it seemed pretty cool. And then when you issued this challenge, I was like, oh, that's perfect. I'll like, I'll go back and, and read you this poem that I bookmarked because I remembered it fondly in my memory. But I went back and read it again and was like, wow, this is a lot more depressing than I remember. Like... This isn't a very uplifting sort of poem to read to you. So I went to see if he had anything that was a little bit cheerier. And you know what? He doesn't. <laughs> it's all pretty much like this. So yeah, um, be pre prepare to be mildly depressed about life. Um, because apparently he was mildly depressed about life. And yeah, so... Um, Without further ado, I suppose, this is The Garden of Proserpine by Algernon Charles Swinburne. Here where the world is quiet, here where all trouble seems, dead winds and spent waves riots in doubtful dreams of dreams, I watch the green field growing for reaping folk and sowing, for harvest time and mowing, a sleepy world of streams. I am tired of tears and laughter, and men that laugh and weep, of what may come hereafter for men that sow to reap. I am weary of days and hours, blown buds of barren flowers, desires and dreams and powers, and everything but sleep. So then it talks about her and how she is, you know, she's living in a barren place and uh, she's waiting for all men born and all that good stuff. So here. <clears throat> Pale beyond porch and portal, crowned with calm leaves, she stands, who gathers all things mortal with cold, immortal hands. Her languid lips are sweeter than loves who fears to greet her, to men that mix and meet her from many times and lands. She waits for each and other, she waits for all men born, forgets the earth, her mother, the life of fruits and corn and spring and seed and swallow take wing for her and follow where summer song rings hollow and flowers are put to scorn there go the loves that wither the old loves with wearier wings and all dead years draw thither and all disastrous things dead dreams of days forsaken 
blind buds that snows have shaken, wild, wild leaves that winds have taken, red strays of ruined springs. We are not sure of sorrow, and joy was never sure. Today we'll die tomorrow, time stoops to no man's lure. And love, grown faint and fretful, with lips but half regretful, sighs and with eyes forgetful, weeps that no loves endure. From too much love of living, from hope and fear set free, we thank with brief thanksgiving, whatever gods may be, that no life lives forever, that dead men rise up never, that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. Then star nor sun shall waken, nor any change of light, nor sound of waters shaken, nor any sound or sight, nor wintry leaves, nor vernal, nor days, nor things diurnal, only the sleep eternal in an eternal night. <laughs> I, again, am crazy about the rhyme scheme of this poem, and the alliteration is crazy. But oh my gosh, what a depressing poem. Like, like <laughs> I, I'm sure you could tell towards the end it was kind of tempting to like go overly dramatic with it. Just because when you have when you have phrases like, um, yeah, and love grown faint and fretful, with lips but half regretful, sighs and with eyes forgetful, weeps that no loves endure. It's hard not to like, <laughs> you know? But I actually love, oh, by the way, the reason that this poem was in my GRE book was because of the line, time stoops to no man's lure, which apparently is the most famous line of the poem. So there you go, fun fact. Um, but the reason I think it stuck with me so much is because of the second stanza, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to indulge myself and read to you again. I am tired of tears and laughter and men that laugh and weep, of what may come hereafter for men that sow to reap. I am weary of days and hours, blown buds of barren flowers, desires and dreams and powers, and everything but sleep. Man, I remember feeling like that. <laughs> Especially sort of in the, the gray November of exam time, when you just can't do any more. Like, that's just, that's just it. Like, that's just everything. And that, that is exactly how I felt. And now that I don't feel like that anymore in this moment, I thought, wow, that is really dark, actually. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually not okay, is it? Yeah, that's actually not, not very okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, so a crazy rhyming man. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope he had a happy life because his poems don't seem to be very happy. Let's see, what are some of... Yeah, he has things, they're called like... He has one called A Ballad of Death. And then there's A Forsaken Garden, A Leave Taking, um, Dead Love. And you're like, oh, oh, Algernon. Yeah, Love and Sleep. The Triumph of Time. And you're like, oh, Okay. So anyway, <laughs> I'm sorry that was such a downer. Um, for this next week, number 15, I would love it if you would please sing me a folk song. Find a folk song and sing it. You have such a wonderful voice and your video last week made me so happy. I can't even tell you. I must have like, I must have listened to that song like 50 times. And uh, yeah, it was just, just such a treat. So go and find a folk song, preferably a cheery one, because I, yeah, need something cheery after that. But it doesn't have to be cheery. Folk songs can also be very moving and, and stuff, too, so that's cool, too. But anyway, I would love to hear your lovely voice and, uh, of course, see your lovely face, and we'll talk about poetry, and it'll be amazing. So, yeah, have a good week, and enjoy the sunshine, and I will see you next Thursday.